Thank you, Chairman. Um, first, I'd like to thank my mother for writing that introduction. <clears throat> Um, I'm, I'm honored to be here, um, and I'm also humbled to be here because uh, to be able to share this um, this journey with you today. And I'm obviously here as a professional, and to share my experiences um, as a professional in helping people on their journey to thrive. But I'm also here on a personal journey as well, just like you, because just like you, I'm sure um, I've had during the course of my life's journey um, setbacks, challenges, failures, disappointment. I've also thankfully had some successes, some joys, some meaning, some, and some satisfaction. And so what I hope to do today is share with you some thoughts on this journey moving from surviving to thriving. And so in this journey we're on, it, it never really ends. And it's never too early to start, and it's never too late to start. And the fact is, is that in terms of this journey, it's not, it never ends. Although, depending on your belief system, one could argue that it ends when we die. But, um, but the fact is that, that we're always on a journey going somewhere, hopefully. Um, although, I guess one's journey could also be just staying where we are. Um, but I also believe that, that you never arrive there. This is one of my favorite saying is, sayings is um, that, when you, uh, that w once you're there, there is no there. But I do believe that there is sort of a, a place you get to, and it's where you're in, and where you, you stop and you take a deep breath and you go, I'm in a good place. And that doesn't mean you stop on your journey, but it means you get to a place where life is pretty good. And, and I actually want to share a very sort of personal story about my journey in this way, in that about six years ago, and I, feel, I remember this very clearly, where I arrived at that place. And I have a cabin in the mountains um, um, near Truckee, um, west, uh, east of San Francisco. And uh, it's always been my happy place. And one of my favorite things to do there is walk my dog um, and also be with my family as well, of course. But um, for many years, I would walk my dog around this place, beautiful area, the lake, and it's very serene. It was called Serene Lakes. And, and then one day I was out, uh, six years ago, literally, 2019, and I, um, I was walking my dog. And all of a sudden, I stopped and I realized something was different. What was different was that I, my mind was clear. There was no negativity, no doubt, no worry, no stress. I was just there in the moment experiencing the beauty. And as I, as I talk about that, I get a little emotional because it was a very powerful time. And so that for me was I arrived there, but it was just a, sort of a way station. It was a really nice truck stop, if you will, along the way to uh, the continuing journey that I'm on. And so today I want to share with you some thoughts on this idea that's very much aligned with, with the motto of learn, grow, and thrive. And it starts with three essential questions. And these are questions that I think are really important to think about and answer because on a journey, you can't get to where you want to go or how to get there unless you can answer what, what I think are some important questions here. The first one is, who do you want to be? What kind of person do you want to be? And I'll, I'll tie a lot of things into that question because if you don't know who you want to be, you can't become that person. Next is, what kind of life do you want to live? And again, you can't live a life that you don't know what it is you want to live. And, la and lastly, um, do, do you want to have an impact? And what kind of impact do you have? And the, the fact is, very few of us can cure cancer or save the world in some other ways. But that doesn't mean that we can't have an impact on people. And it might just be playing a small role, medium, large, it doesn't matter. Because the satisfaction is having an impact on the world beyond ourselves. So, forks in the road. This is a metaphor that for me is very powerful and a big part of the work I do. And what I, what I, when I talk about a fork in the road, yes, there, oftentimes you come to forks in the road that have multiple forks, but let's just, for the sake of keeping things simple, talk about just two roads. And there's the bad road and the good road. And the bad road, do you know why they call it the bad road? Because it's bad. It doesn't feel, it, it feels bad and you do bad. The good road, they call it the good road, of course, because it's darn good. You feel good on the good road, and good things happen on the good road. Here's the challenge. So, by the way, how many of you um, choose the bad road? Raise your hand if you choose the bad road. No, of course not. We don't choose the bad road. How many of you sometimes or sometimes often go down the bad road? Yeah, we, we all do. It's part, of, it's part of being human for sure. 
but taking the good road, it's what I call a simple but not easy choice. It's simple because, again, would you rather go down the bad road or the good road? Duh, of course the good road. But it's not easy because there are a lot of forces, which I will describe later, that pull us down the bad road. So the good road, it's not, it's, it's not our natural way to go very often as human beings. And again, I'll explain that why in a little bit. But to take the good road, it takes awareness. You have to know you're on the bad road. You have to know what the good road is. Because if, if you don't see the fork in the road, what are you going to continue to do? Go down the bad road. Unless you have a, four, a monster truck, maybe you can go off road or something like that. But bottom line, you're going to stay on the bad road if you don't have a way of getting off. And then, though, it's commitment. Because again, as I, I'll get to in a little bit, there are a lot of forces pulling us down the bad road. And so we have to make a commitment to take the darn good road. And the last part is persistence. It takes a lot of effort to continue taking that good road when we're being pulled down the bad road. The good thing about the good road is that it's self-reinforcing. How many of you have been down the good road lately? Yeah, I'm sure all of us have. Um, how's it feel? Good. <laughs> and if you, if you go down the good road and you feel good and good things happen, what do you want to do next time? Take the good road. So what happens is it becomes self-perpetuating as well, where you take it more and more. And do you know what happens to the bad road? It becomes overgrown with weeds until it's no longer there. Now, the, the unfortunate reality of life, of course, is that there's another bad road down the road. And so we're constantly facing these forks in the road. But this idea of, of, of having this, this tangible image of I can go down the bad road or to go, on the, to go down the good road helps make it easier to see the bad road and then take the good road. So first fork in the road is simply take the good road. And just being aware of that idea of like, what road am I on? And is it the road I want to be on? That's a powerful first step. Now let's talk about survival versus thrival. When I, I've been using this concept for many years. And when I first started using the word thrival, I thought, gosh, I've just created a new word. But then I looked it up on the internet, and it's been used before. We just don't hear it very often. And so let's start with, with um, survival. Survival is human's most powerful instinct. Now, I want to step back for a sec, and I'm going to talk a little bit about evolution. At the same time, I want to be respectful of those some of you might not believe in evolution. And if that's the case, then I encourage you to just focus on the areas that I think we can all agree on, and, and hopefully you can gain benefit from it. Um, so th the human instinct to survive, it is the foundation of everything that we've become. Because without our ability to survive, then life ends. I also want to be very respectful of the use of the word survival. Because the, our use of the word survival in this room is very different than the word the use of the word survival for, many, for millions upon mi millions of people around the world, where they're literally trying just to survive. So I want to be very clear on that distinction. We are all very fortunate that we're able to be here at CUSM, and for the, we're mostly healthy, and we make some money, and we can live our lives. That alone is worth being very grateful for. But because of our nature that I'll get into, we want a little more, and that's not a bad thing. So we also have this other instinct, and it's called the thrival instinct. We have this drive to thrive, this drive to grow, to challenge ourselves, to push our limits, to seek new boundaries, to boldly go where no person has gone before if you're a Star Trek fan. And if you think about all the advancements that have occurred in the last 250,000 years since we became officially homo sapiens, it, whether it's developing the wheel, agriculture, um, uh, automobile, the internet, uh, all going into space, all these different areas, that has been driven by our thrival instinct. Here's the problem. Whoops. Okay, made a mistake. Is that survival and thrival are in conflict. So survival is about safety. It's about comfort. It's about security. And what doesn't, don't we all want to feel that way? We are wired to want to feel that way. Because on the Serengeti 250,000 years ago, if we didn't feel safe, secure, and comfortable, what was likely to follow? Death. By clubbing or being eaten by a saber-toothed tiger. I'm not sure saber-toothed tigers existed at the same time, but give me some, some latitude here. Um, but the problem with survival is that it can produce stagnation. And this is where there's that conflict with thrival. And thrival means taking risks, being insecure, being uncomfortable, having uncertainty. Nobody likes to feel any of those things, right? 
and yet they're essential for us to grow and to thrive. So, if we want to thrive, it has to override our, our basic, most fundamental instinct to survive. So fork in the road, which do you choose? Raise your hand if you choose survival. You do? Okay. Raise your hand if you choose thrival. Okay. So, very easy to, present, to make that choice sitting here. But, when you come to a fork in the road, which road do you often take? The survival road. Why? Because it's safe, because it's secure, and it's comfortable. And so, and yet, that, those are those moments that matter. At that fork in the road, when you're faced with, oh my gosh, do I do what's comfortable and safe, or do I get uncomfortable and do something different? That's the challenge we face. Now let's talk about some of the forces against survival, because there are some formidable forces against our willingness, our desire, our instinct to thrive. Let's talk about a couple of those. First of all, our primitive instincts. The survival instinct has emerged over the last 250 million years. It has perfected those things that enable us to survive. And they are primary because, again, you can't thrive until you first survive. Very powerful force. Also, emotional baggage is another force that goes against thrival. How many of you are human beings? Raise your hand. Most of you? Okay. As human beings, we all bring baggage from our upbringing. What do I mean by baggage? It's basically ways of thinking, emotional experiences, um, behavior, the way we interact with the world and other people, that at some point in our lives, early in our lives, it, it served a function. It had a purpose. It was usually to protect ourselves in some way from some perceived threat. But now, it doesn't work. But it's well in our system because it's, we've been doing this for, for a very long time. So, uh, so emotional baggage. The third is ingrained habits. So think about if, if you're a golfer or a tennis player or a skier, any sport that's technical. If you practice bad technique, what do you become good at? Bad technique. And what comes out? on the course, the hill, the court, whatever. Bad technique and bad habits. And so the same thing with mental habits. The way we think, the way we feel, the way we respond to the world. If we do them over and over and over again, we become really good at them, even if they're not healthy or productive or serve our best interests now. And these habits get wired into our brain. And so change them is very difficult. There are also four things that we humans really don't like. Unfamiliarity, unpredictability, lack of control, and discomfort. And again, purely evolutionary here, because on the Serengeti, 250,000 years ago, if you experienced these four feelings, what was likely to follow? Death, exactly. So, these forces are very powerful, and more than anything else here, they are unconscious. Like we talked about earlier, we don't choose to go down a bad road. Nobody chooses to go down a bad road. But we are propelled down the bad road by these forces that we don't, or that we're not even aware of. So, fork in the road here, make the unconscious conscious. So much of my work with individual clients is about helping them understand those unconscious forces that are taking them down a road that they really don't want to go down. Because as long as they're unconscious, we can't do anything about them because we're not aware of them. And in talking about the unconscious, I know you may be thinking, oh, Sigmund Freud here, things like that. And, and so, as, as um, Tracy indicated, I have a PhD in psychology, I have clinical training, but I don't practice clinical psychology. I don't deal with mental illness. All these things I talk about, this is just, this is part of being human. It's just normal stuff. But normal doesn't mean healthy and positive and beneficial for enabling us to thrive. So this process of exploring ways to take the unconscious and make them conscious, because when they're conscious, then we can do something about them. By example, recognizing the good road. Now, brief lesson in neuroanatomy. And if there are any um, the physicians in the audience or nurses, or medical staff, um, I'm going to make this quite simple. Um, but uh, so give me a little uh, give me a little grace on this one. 
Um, first of all, the amygdala. It's a part of the primitive brain. And its purpose is basically it's a filter through which it processes all information from the outside world and determines whether there's a threat to our survival. And if there is a perceived threat, it triggers our survival instinct. Most powerfully, of course, the very well-known fight or flight. Now, little side note on this whole fight or flight thing. My basic belief is that what worked on the Serengeti 250,000 years ago doesn't work now. So fight or flight worked really well for millions upon millions of years. Doesn't work in 2024 modern life. So if you're upset about something, does fighting work? Does fleeing work? No. And yet, again, this for these forces have been around for a very long time. Then we have the prefrontal cortex, what, we call the, what I call the PFC. And that's part of the evolved brain. And it's really what separates us from animals, because animals don't have the ability to make choices. They simply act on their instincts. And it has to do with executive functioning. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this phrase. It's very popular in school these days, especially with teenage boys. Um, if, I, I have two daughters, so thankfully I, I don't have to deal with that. But, um, but the idea is the research has shown that executive functioning, the PFC, doesn't fully develop till you're uh, about 25. And for some people, not till you're well into your 50s. Um, but I don't want to get personal here. Um, and so it, what it involves is weighing risks and reward, long-term and short-term consequences, um, planning, organizing, considering options. Also, very importantly, controlling impulses. And what are those controlling impulses? Well, it's, it's that amygdala firing and the limbic system and other, other aspects of, um, of our primitive brain. And ultimately, though, it's about giving us the capacity to make choices and make dis deliberate decisions. And so, so much of my work, and I say this sort of humorously but also seriously, is that it's about who wins the battle. Does our amygdala win, or does our prefrontal cortex win? And in order, to, in order to thrive, your PFC has to win. <clears throat> now let's talk about fuel. This is a little bit metaphorical here, um, very different from, from anatomy, but it's also, for me, a very powerful message as well. So we are all driven by fuel that propels us forward. It propels us to, to behave in certain ways, to feel certain things, to think certain things. To thrive, you need to be running on 100% pure rocket fuel. Now, being realistic, it's not going to be 100%, but if it can be 90 to 95%, that's pretty good fuel. The problem is, is that our fuel can be contaminated. And how can this fuel be contaminated? First of all, kind of like I talked about earlier, by our primitive instincts, by our emotional baggage, by those ingrained habits. But more than anything, it's contaminated by fear. Fear, which s served us so well for so, many, for so long in our evolution, no longer serves us in most situations as we're trying to thrive. So the fork in the road is to know your contaminated fuel. Know what fuel you have in you, tied in with those four areas, that prevents you from thriving. Now, let's talk about rocket fuel. This is the fun stuff. Your rocket fuel comes from three sources. First, your emotions. Now, I, I've sort of painted emotions as this bad thing because they seem, they've, they've evolved in certain ways to, um, to help us survive. But in fact, again, it comes from the primitive brain. Its purpose is to motivate us to action. So if you think about all the emotions we experience, they all serve a purpose to get us to do something that helps us survive. So fear, what's the, what's the, what does it motivate us to do? Run away, right. How about anger? Fight. How about disappointment? Persist, keep trying. Uh, frustration, persevere over the obstacles keeping you from getting where you want to go. So you, you can go through every single emotion. They all serve a valuable purpose. And we talk a lot about good and bad emotions. Well, in the research world, they don't talk about that because every emotion is good or can be good. We talk about unpleasant emotions. Nobody likes frustration or sadness or anger or fear, but they are valuable tools, if you will, to help us know what the situation is and, and in some cases, how to respond. The second place, uh, the second source of rocket fuel is our values. And our values come from our, evolve, our evolved brain. 
Animals don't have values. They're driven again by one thing, their instincts. Their purpose is to provide, uh, the purpose of values is to provide direction. And I'll get into that in a little more detail in a second. The last one, and we're gonna get a little squishy here, I'm sorry, and I call this the spiritual brain. Now, I have to admit I'm not a very spiritual person, although the, my late mother-in-law, who was a Buddhist for like 35 years, called me a closet Buddhist because I didn't speak the language of Buddhism and spirituality, but I, sort of, I guess she thought I lived a fairly spiritual life. So um, I'm willing to go with that. And the spiritual brain, its purpose is the, our guidance system. And again, I'll talk about that in more depth in a second. So think about that idea about your rocket fuel in terms of your emotions, your values, and your true self. And the fork and road here is know your rocket fuel because you can't tap into that rocket fuel unless you know what it is. So let's look at each of these three sources in a little more detail. First of all, emotions as rocket fuel. Contaminated emotions, here's a good list of them. Fear, anger, frustration, jealous, envy, resentment, guilt, embarrassment, shame. How many of you want to feel those emotions? No, they're, they're, that's like cringeworthy emotions for sure. And yet, they do serve a purpose. For example, guilt, embarrassment, and shame, they evolved to, to ensure that we stayed within societal norms. But unfortunately, they've been sort of misused in a way. Um, and again, fear, anger, frustration, all have, ha have served a purpose. Now let's talk about rocket fuel. Love, joy, passion, excitement, pride, inspiration, satisfaction, all these how many of you want to feel these things? Totally. Absolutely. She's super excited back there. Way to go. Yeah. And this, this is the rocket fuel because there's no, no contamination in this. If you can tap into those emotions, you're, you're, you're gone. You're, out, you're, you're, you're cruising down the, the thrival highway, if you will. I just made that up. Yeah. Anyway, so why not just choose the good emotions? Two reasons. First of all, negative emotions are primary. Why? because we needed to know if a situation was threatening to us really quickly. Like you can get by, you can survive with, without love and joy and satisfaction and those things. You can survive. You probably can't survive without fear or anger or frustration or disappointment. Second of all, emotions are two sides of the same coin. You can't cherry pick your emotions. And we live in a very emotionally repressed culture where emotionality is viewed as weakness, especially among men. And yet, emotional vulnerability and expressiveness is a strength because it takes courage to be vulnerable. Because by definition, when you're vulnerable, you can get hurt. So to be that way, that takes tremendous strength. But unfortunately, those aren't the messages that we often get in our culture. So again, you can't just pick the good emotions. If you want to feel joy, excitement, pride, passion, inspiration, etc., you must also be willing to feel sadness, grief, pain, hurt, frustration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But you don't want to feel that way for two reasons. One, it just feels bad. Second of all, we're wired to not want to feel those things because what comes next after those feelings, evolutionarily speaking, is of course So the fork in the road, accept the so-called bad emotions and embrace the good emotions. In other words, feel deeply. And at, at the end, I'm gonna dive into that even more because it's really, really important. Values, now, second source is rocket fuel. So what are values? Well, it's basically what we de deem in our lives is to be important to us. Here's a great sort of reverse engineering way to figure out what your values are. Because it's easy to sit there and go, oh, of course, I value integrity and honesty and hard work and discipline and so on. Also, a little caveat on this as well. I always feel like when I talk about values, I'm working, walking into a minefield. Because the sad reality is of whichever side of the, the political spectrum you're on, it has been, values have been politicized and weaponized. But when I talk about values, I talk about values that pretty much everybody, no matter what your belief systems are, we can all agree on. So kindness, compassion, hard work, discipline, all those responsibility, all those other things. And so it's really important for you to know your values. So again, the reverse, reverse engineering. How do you devote your time, your money, and your energy? Because we spend our time, our money, and our energy on things that we value most. So I, I, I value physical activity. 
And so I spend my money and my time training for triathlons and buying bikes and such. If you value giving, and that's not to say I don't give, but yeah. Anyway, um, that, um, that's where you put your time, money, and energy. So it's important to really think about what do you value? And stay away from the cliches and say, OK, but, but what values am I living? So values determine our destination. That is, who we want to be, what, how we want to live our lives, and what kind of impact we want to have, and also how we get there. Um, GPS for the soul it sounds like a, a book, but um, it seems very sort of tech, deep tech or something. I don't know. Anyway, so fork in the road here. Know your values. And then live them. Goes back to what I talked about, about forks in the road. Simple but not easy choice. It's relatively simple. It takes a little thought, but it, it takes, uh, you just have to think about what do you value. And then simple, but it's not easy because it's hard to live our values. And one of those challenges is, of course, that we live in a culture that I think embraces toxic values. So if you think about what's important in our society today, wealth, power, status, physical attractiveness, and there was some research, very upsetting research that came out, I think, a year or two ago, that um, an ongoing study where 25 years ago they asked young people, what's the most important thing for you? And they said, making the world a better place. The vast majority said that. Do you know what they say now? Money and celebrity. That's the goal of young people these days. That's terrifying. And, you know, well, I'll, I'll get into that in a sec. So third source is true self. And so, you know, what is the true self? It's really, really hard to define. It's, but it's, it's like who you are at your core. And like, what does that mean? And so let's see if this helps. Again, going back to values, attitudes, beliefs, spirit, aspirations, hopes, dreams. It's like getting at this core of who you are. Here's the problem, though. Our true selves can be suppressed and often are. And by our emotional baggage, because we have to be a certain way in order to feel safe, um, by parents who want, some parents can kind of force their kids to be a certain way when they're not that way. Um, peers, peer pressure, huge with young people and popular culture and technology. Now, I want to diverge here a little bit about this because this is something I'm absolutely passionate about and is incredibly upsetting. Po we've always had popular culture, but popular culture changed because it's no longer popular. Popular culture used to mean the culture was shaped by the populace, but it's not any longer. It's shaped by big corporations who care about one thing and one thing only, which is making money, right? And that's been around for a long time too. But now we have this thing, if you've probably heard of it, called the internet. So now the culture is not just, it used to be growing up, the culture was family, friends, neighborhood, community, schools, churches, activities, and so on. Now it's the world. And, and parents used to be able to control most of those concentric circles because they chose where their kids, where they lived, and what schools they went to, and what activity they participate in. But now, obviously with kids, and I have two teenage daughters, they're on the phone all the time, and they're getting messages that are truly toxic. But we are all victims of our culture. It's very difficult to resist the messages we get from our culture, because we want to be accepted. So it is even more challenging and, and, and a lot of these messages that are coming from popular culture crush the true self. And they, people, kids, people in general, but kids especially, create a false self or an inauthentic self. And you see it on the internet. And there's, uh, there's been a ton of fascinating research on this that has found that, that people present a self on their social media that is not an accurate representation of who they are. So instead of, instead of being formative, in the expression of their true self, they're being performative. They're sitting there thinking, not how can I show people who I am, rather, how can I show people who they want me to be? I need to curate myself. I don't know if you've heard that phrase before. It's horrible to curate yourself. That is so inauthentic and toxic. And yet, it is our reality these days. So if you can identify and be fueled by your true self, 
you can't not be and do your best. And personal example here. So I, I think I've always expressed my true self in, in one particularly powerful way, and that's in my writing. So as Tracy indicated, I've written a bunch of books, and I, I, I blog a lot, and I, I write all the time. And that comes from my true self fuel, because part of my true self is, is my desire to create and share ideas. So when I get an idea, I can't not write about it. I can't, because for me not to would be to, for me to be inauthentic to myself. And, and so if, if you can manifest that, if you can figure out what your true self is and express that outward, it's, it's, it's a truly beautiful thing. So the fork in the road is know and express your true self. Again, easier said than done, especially these days, but it's in there and it wants to come out. But it's been beaten down and beaten down and beaten down until it, it feels helpless. But it can be brought back and it is life changing. And it's part of being able to thrive. Because you can't thrive if you're not in touch with who you really are. Ah, let go of fear. This is the hardest one. Because our primitive brain doesn't want us to let go of fear. Because what might happen if we let go of fear? Well, in Serengeti, 250,000 years ago, we're dead. But again, life has changed. So how do we let go of the fear? Well, let's talk about different kinds of fear. Fear of failure epidemic in our culture, probably the number one reason why parents send their kids to me. They don't know that's why they're sending their kids to me. They send their kids to me because they're not doing that well in school, or they're, 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 they're great athletes in practice, but they're not performing well in competition. Uh, same with music, young musicians and so on. But failure is massive there. Um, rejection. There's no more powerful and personal form of failure than rejection. And as somebody who, and I'll tell a couple stories about, a story about this in a little while, as somebody who's been rejected an awful lot of my life, there's nothing hurts more because there's only one reason. What's wrong with me? So it's, a, it's an attack on us personally. Um, how people view us. We are social beings and we have a strong need for people to view us in positive ways. So we engage in what's called impression management. And on, in social media, that's exactly what kids are doing. They're engaging in the social media so, to make sure that other people see how cool we are. But more fundamental than that is how we view ourselves. How we view ourselves. And, and so a lot of times we, how many of you mind read? Raise your hand if you mind read. Okay. How many of you, how many of you uh, thank you. How many of you think, or, or think like, oh, she or he is thinking this about me? How many of you do that? Yeah, we all do it. None of us can mind read. But actually, yes, we are all mind readers. But only one mind. Whose mind is that we're reading? Ourselves. So when we think other people are judging us, the chances are they're not even thinking about us. We're not that important to most people. Because what are they doing? They're sitting there thinking like, oh, I wonder what they're thinking about me. <laughs> so ultimately, it is we're thinking about ourselves and how we view ourselves. And another scary part of that is the fear of confirming that they will see who we really are. And this goes to imposter syndrome, which has become a very popular concept. They'll see that I'm not that smart or I'm not that interesting or that, that I'm not capable of and I'm not that worthwhile. Whoa, that's, that's something to fear. That's painful stuff. But whatever you fear isn't really that bad. Because another interesting thing about this, so I, I talk about all these things we fear. It's not really that, those list of five things that we fear. It's the emotions we think we're going to feel if those things happen, that it will be absolutely devastating. And, and these are the same things that, that, that lead to emotional baggage when we're young. So when we're eight years old and we're in a situation that's very scary for us. So we, we, we become perfectionists. We become control freaks. We um, become really insecure and have to devalue other people. And that served a purpose back then. If we carry that forward. That doesn't work so well in adulthood. And, and so, but there's a difference between eight-year-old us and 25, 45, 65 us. We're very different people. What at eight years old would be excruciating emotional pain, as adults, we have resources. We have maturity. We have a PFC. We have perspective. Will it hurt if we're rejected? Yeah. 
but enough to avoid attempts at healthy relationships? No. Because it, it, one of the most powerful messages I try to communicate to my clients is this. You will be OK. Yes, there will be times when you will hurt badly. You will cry. It will be super hard. But you'll be OK. And it won't, it won't, you will survive the emotional pain. But only by being willing to accept that are you able to let go of the fear and put yourself out there where these things might happen. So fork in the road, threat versus challenge. If I had to break down everything I do to help people achieve their goals, to, to produce the, the personal growth they want, if I could boil it down to a simple distinction, do you perceive the situation as a threat or a challenge? Our primitive brain wants us to perceive these situations as threats. Because if, we're th if we perceive it as a threat, we're going to feel fear, and we're not going to do the th those things. And we're not going to thrive, that's for sure. So think about you perceive a situation as a threat. And so what's our natural reaction when we perceive a situation as a threat? Avoid it. Run away. Our thoughts, negative, pessimistic, self-defeating. Our emotions, fear, frustration, all negative. Physiologically, stress, anxiety. And our goal is to get as far away from that threat as possible. Challenge. When you're challenged by something, what direction you want to go? You want to go at that thing. Your thoughts, positive, motivated, focused. Emotions, excitement, pride, inspiration. Physiology, yeah, it depends on your style, but you're pretty psyched up or you're, or you're super chill. And the goal when you're challenged by something is to pursue your goals, to pursue success, to pursue that which you want. Well, actually, no, hang on a second. One more thing I forgot. The thing about threat versus challenge is it's all perception. It's not reality. It's how you look at a situation. And so um, uh, Tracy indicated that I'm a, a fairly accomplished uh, age group triathlete. And I was just in Miami um, this past weekend doing two races. And it was 95 degrees and really hot. And I live in Northern California. And, uh, and so you know, one of the difficulties about what I do for a living is I have to practice what I preach. And so I, 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 it was like, oh, God, this could be really hard. It's like, wait a minute. This is why I'm here. So I it started as a threat, natural for us to react that way, but then I turned it around. I took the good road. And it turned, I, I, had, I had two really good races, and it was super hard, but that's why I do it. Because if it wasn't hard, there's no reason to do it. <clears throat> Next thing is to know your destination. As I talked about at the beginning, if you don't know where you want to go, you can't get there. And so destination and directions. Um, again, using values, emotions, and true self to, to help create the guidance there. And then to establish smarter goals. Now, this is an acronym that's become very popular. It's been highly researched. And let's see if I can remember what these are. Um, uh, specific, measurable, accepted, Realistic, time limited, exciting, and recorded. And if you go online, type in smarter goals. There'll be some variations of that, but those are the, five, those are the how many are there? Uh, seven I like. And because if you don't know how to get somewhere, and, and part, of being, part of thriving is aspiring to achieve certain things. And I believe as part of our, primal, pri, our, our thrival instinct, one of the great powers in our lives is the ability to set a goal, pursue a goal, and achieve a goal. It's immensely satisfying, as you all know, in your work and personal life. Another big part of this is what I call the three C's. And the first one is conscious. And like I talked about earlier, you have to make what you want to do to thrive conscious. Because if you don't, you can't take the good road. Then you have to make the commitment, because it's hard, because those forces of, of primitive instincts um, emotional baggage, uh, ingrained habits, and fear, they are unbelievably powerful. At pull, they want to pull you down the bad road. So you need to go, wait a minute. I'm taking the darn good road. So that commitment's important. And lastly is, is consistent. You have to do it every single time until it becomes a part of what you do. And again, simple but not easy. 
it is a moment-to-moment -moment choice because life is full. Every day, life is full of forks in the road. Some inconsequential, what should I have for lunch? But even, even then, that can be consequential because maybe you're trying to eat healthier. But you know, those cookies look really good. So being aware of those moments where there are forks in the road rather than just continuing your life down the bad road because that's the way you've always done it. Um, so the fork in the road lets your rocket fuel propel you. This one is so central to my true self and to what I think is absolutely necessary for all of us to thrive, is taking your shot. Because the reason why most people are unsuccessful is because they simply don't take the shot. So what's the risk of taking your shot? Well, you might miss. And if you miss, you might feel bad. What's the value of taking your shot? Now, let me see if I can remember all these. Um, the first is you give yourself a chance to succeed. You give yourself a chance to score. Second of all, um, even if you miss, you'll feel pretty good about yourself. Why? Because you at least took the darn shot. Third, um, you won't have any regrets. Because what can often happen if you don't take the shot? You, after you go like, ah, I wish I'd taken the shot. There's no way back machine. If you, if you, you have to be pretty old to know that reference from a cartoon when I was a kid. Um, there's no way back machine. You can't change the past. But you, you can change the future. So you have another opportunity, another fork in the road. And the final win is you score. And because I believe you keep shooting, you're going to score sooner or later. Or maybe you need to change games. So two great quotes from Michael Jordan, first of all. A Nike poster from years ago. It said, I was given the ball 26 times with 10 seconds left and the winning shot in my hand. And I missed. What made him the GOAT, although we could, I don't want to get into it with LeBron fans here, um, is that it didn't prevent him from taking the shot. Because I'm, I'm sure they have this, 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 this statistic out there, but for those 26 he missed, he probably made hundreds that won games over his career. And then went Wayne Gretzky, again, maybe my all-time favorite quote, I missed 100% of the shots I didn't take. And you wouldn't believe the number of kids I work with, young athletes, who like, like soccer players, like they have the shot and they pass it off. Why? They're afraid to miss. So make taking your shot your goal. And I'm going to get to something even more powerful than that. So I'm going to tell you a little personal story, embarrassing, but um, for me it's very powerful. So um, I, when I was in high school, I was, I, when I was 13 years old, I was 4 foot 9, 89 pounds. A little guy, late to develop physically. I was terrified of girls. To, the idea of asking a girl on a date was just horrific for me. I, get so, I couldn't do it. Plus, I was introverted, which I still am to some degree, and I was also super shy. But when I graduated from high school, I was going to college in the fall, I decided enough already. So I, just, I set a goal for myself. And I, I guess one could say this is a smarter goal. Um, I, I set a goal of I'm going to ask five girls out that summer. And this was not easy because I was working um, for a number of years in high school. I worked as a carpenter in an aircraft plant outside of Hartford, Connecticut. And so they're all grown-up women um, instead of like, you know, I was like 18 or something. And um, so I used a lot of the techniques that I talked to the young athletes and the performers that I work with, positive thinking and breathing and visualization and things like that. And that summer, you know what? I asked five girls out. They all said no. <laughs> Success or failure? Why? Right. A lot, of, a lot of people say failure because I didn't get the date. But that wasn't the goal. Why? Because I couldn't control that. I asked those five darn girls out, and they, they were the ones who lost out because they didn't, get it, they, they didn't say yes. But that wasn't the point. I took my shot. And ever since then, literally, a part of my true self, a part of my value system, part of my emotions has been in every aspect of my life. I've been willing to take the shot. Because I realized, was I disappointed when these, when these girls uh, w didn't uh, want to go out with me? But I realized that I was OK. I'd survive. And so that has guided me, because I can assure you, until I finally got married, I was set, I, young w women say no to me a lot. <laughs> um, but, but I kept trying. I kept taking the shot until I found somebody who I fell in love with, and you know, life is good. So be willing to take the shot, recognizing that if, if it doesn't work out, I still felt good about the fact that I took the shot. So fork in the road. Make taking your shot not even just a goal. Make it a habit. Because that way, there's no fork in the road. 
So let's say you have an opportunity. And it could be work, it could be relationships, whatever it is. And if there's a fork in the road, you still have to make a choice. But if it is part of your value system, of your being, there's no choice. It's just, I'm going down the good road. I'm taking the shot. Simple. That's the place you want to get to. But it starts with those times when it's like survival kicks in. Oh my god, I'll be rejected, or I, I won't get the job, or something like that. But what happens if you do? And I'm a strong believer that with anything in life, you know, they say 90% of Woody Allen said 90% of success is just showing up. That other 10% though is is putting yourself out there and taking the risk. So next time you're in that situation, see if you can recognize that fork in the road and go, I'm taking the shot. And whatever happens after, you'll feel so good because you took the shot. And you know what? You might score. And, if you, and sooner or later, you will score. That's what I believe. OK, before I wrap things up with some deeper stuff, I want to come back to some very practical stuff. And that's this idea about metrics for thriving. One of the hardest things about the work I do is that it's not tangible. The mind is like grasping onto fog. Whereas I use the, the example of physical conditioning. It's very tangible. You go into the gym, you lift weights that actually you can touch and feel and measure. And if you keep doing this for a while, you get stronger. With the mind, it's hard, it's hard to notice these changes. But I want to share with you a couple of ways that you can make your progress more tangible. First of all, the way you think. When you start thriving, when you start taking a shot and going down the good road, you start thinking differently from negative, doubting, self-defeating to positive, optimistic, and, and, um, and supportive. Emotions, you start feeling differently. And that fork in the road I experienced six years ago, I started feeling differently. I was happier. I was more at peace. And in, I wrote a blog post about this a long time ago that, that in many ways happiness is simply the absence of angst, the absence of stress, the absence of anxiety. Because then it's like, whew, you feel OK. Um, you, you feel different physiologically. You're more relaxed. You sleep better. You feel better. Because your body is no longer just surviving. Um, your body language. Closing off, people sense that. And you're, you open up. And I'll, I'll get, that's, that's an important thing I'm going to talk about in the next slide. Um, how people respond to you. When you're thriving, when you're happier, when all these positive things are happening, people sense that. And they're going to want to come to you. Whereas if they, if they feel like tension and, 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 and defensiveness and so on, I can assure you, I've experienced that a lot in my life. And if, there's, if I have any regrets in my life, it's that I, I sent that message out because it kept people away from me. Um, how you respond to people. All of a sudden, it's like you want to engage with people instead of like, eh, like this. Um, edges of your personality. And I, again, again, this, I suppose, is, is come from a personal place, not a professional one, is that I, I was not the most popular guy in the world in my professional life or my personal life, for, for that matter. Not that I was a jerk or anything. I just I had an edge because I was defended. I was protecting myself from being hurt. And as, as I matured and figured all this stuff out, the edges rounded, and I became softer and more likable. And the feedback I get now is that I'm a fairly likable fellow these days, which is really gratifying for me. Um, relationships change. They get deeper. They get healthier. They get more positive. They get more emotional. Now, wrapping things up, 10 ways to thrive. First, embrace your humanity. We live in a world, in a culture, where the messages are we have to be perfect. Perfect looks. Perfect car, perfect house, perfect everything. That is really tiring, being perfect all the time. One of the most important things that I've seen in my evolution is that I've embraced my humanity. I revel in my flaws without using them as excuses. And, and it's, it's relieving. It's like, oh, I don't have to be perfect all the time? Whew. I can make mistakes? And one of the, most, the hardest thing is owning your mistakes. Like, when you screw up, what do most people do when they screw up? Wasn't my fault. They, it was their fault. But being able to say, I was wrong. Whoa. That's so hard to do because, well, if, I, if I'm wrong, well, maybe there's something wrong with me. But being able to take ownership and admit when you made a mistake, not only is it like liberating, but it's, it's a powerful connector with other people. So embracing your humanity. Not using them excuses, but saying, like, I make mistakes. I screw up. 
and then be able to say, I'm sorry. Here's a great little exercise. Next time you did something wrong, say, I'm sorry. And then do you know what kind of punctuation you want to put after that? What do most people do? They put a comma. And what's the next word they use? But, exactly. And all of a sudden, they've taken away the, 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 the accountability, the ownership of the apology. So just say, I'm really sorry. I hurt you. Period. Wow. That is like glue to healthy relationships. Um, pursue success is defined by your values. Really tough these days because these days in our culture, again, it's about wealth, status, power, etc. Figure out what you value and use that as, the, as, as the, 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 the markers for how you define success. For me, I mean, I earn a decent living. I'm not wealthy by any means. But for me, my purpose and passion in life is to create and share ideas that make people's lives better. That's success for me. Not all the books, all those things. Those are just, those are just manifestations of my, of my purpose on life, in life. Focus on the process and not the outcome. Again, we live in a world where it's all about results. You gotta win, you gotta be the best. Really tough for young kids, for sure, with grades and, and, um, and in sports and the arts and so on. The problem is that people think that the way you get results is to focus on results. The exact opposite. If you, if you focus on results, well, first of all, think of it this way. When, when does the outcome of anything you do happen? At the end. If you're, not, you're focused on the end, what are you not focused on? What you need to do to get there, to produce the outcome. Also, what makes us nervous? Is it the process or the, or the possible outcome? The possible outcome, most, most in particularly, is failure. But if you focus on the process of what you need to do to perform your best and be the best person you can be, you're likely to perform well or be good, and you get the outcome you want. So focus on what you need to do to get where you want to go, not focusing on where you want to go. Um, live with abandon and without fear. Whatever you do, throw yourself into it, 100%. First of all, that's the only way you're going to be truly successful. And again, it goes back to, I mean, this is the holy grail, I suppose, metaphorically speaking. If you can do everything without fear, you're liberated. You're free. You're going to throw yourself 100% rocket fuel into everything you do. And you might not be the, become the number one best in, in your field, but you're going to become pretty darn good. And it's going to feel really good. Ah, feel deeply. This is massive, people. Feeling deeply is really hard. It goes back to the two sides of the, of the same coin. Because you cannot just feel deeply about the good stuff. You have to feel deeply about everything. Allow yourself to feel bad. If you don't, it's not like it goes away. It goes into what I call our chamber of pain, which is like this, this like little tank deep inside of us that we stuff all the pain we don't want to feel in, we, and, we, and we, we crank the hatch down like a submarine. Problem is, unlike submarines where they're waterproof, those the gaskets on the hatches, in our chamber of pain, it leaks out. And it comes out in anxiety, stress, worry, doubt, fear, unhappiness. Allow yourself to feel bad. Cry if you feel bad. If you're angry, don't yell but express it. It's the hardest thing in the world to do because it feels bad. But that's how you ultimately feel good. Because it enables you to also to not only let out all that bad stuff, but also lets you express all the good stuff. Um, be grateful to yourself and others. This is something that, I don't know, it hasn't been that long for me, been able to do. It's like every, every person, whether it's a, a checker at the supermarket or really hard to do sometimes customer service on the phone, um, is just be grateful. They're doing the best they can and they help. And so I'm always like, thank you so much. You're such a pro. All the, whatever it might be, look for those opportunities. And there's a ton of research out there, as you probably know, that, that gratitude is, 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 is bi-directional. When you express gratitude towards somebody, they feel better and we feel better. So it's a win-win. But when you get cranky and, and you're busy and stressed out, it's like, uh, I don't have time for that. And then be grateful for yourself because you're doing some good stuff. People care about you, you care about people, you're trying to make the world a better place, being here for sure. Um, do the hard stuff first. You know, we don't like to do the hard stuff first because it's hard, so we put it off. And then we either don't do it at all or we do it really poorly because we don't have enough time. Do the hard stuff first because that way you don't have to worry about it. This has been a philosophy of mine with physical training, for example, and my conditioning, my sport training. It's like, I want to do the hard, hard workouts first because then I don't have to worry about them. I can put them behind me and everything else is just easy. 
So next time at work, if there's a project you don't really want to do, you're thinking about it, uh, think about this moment and say, okay, I'm going to do the hard work first. Because ultimately, you want to get it done, and you want to do it well. Because it's the hard stuff that makes you successful. The easy stuff, anybody can do that. So prioritize and jump into the hard stuff. See it as a challenge, not a threat. Um, establish deep and nurturing relationships. Again, this is something I was not good at for a long time in my life, and it's, it's probably my greatest re regret as a person. And I'm, I'm, I've been correcting it and been doing a pretty good job of it. And, cause, and again, that goes back to that idea, it's never too late. But the, re relationships, those are ultimately what we're about. Be open. So this is an interesting one. Um, and this goes to threat versus challenge. When, when you feel threatened by somebody, let's say somebody's coming at you, you go like this. And metaphorically, we do this all the time to keep people away from us, to protect us from getting hurt. And I use this other metaphor of, of um, a castle. So we're afraid. So we build this giant castle with really high walls. Think like Monty Python, um, uh, medieval England. And it's, it works really well. As long as we're in that castle, we are safe. But what does that castle turn into? A prison. Yeah. You can't get out. And nobody else can get in. So you're safe, but you're alone. And if you can walk out of that castle, that, which has become a prison, you'll find out it's not that scary out there. And so here's a great exercise. And I do this with the athletes I work with before they're about to compete. I want you to open your arms. Everybody, everybody try this. Just open your arms. As a general rule, this is an uncomfortable thing to do. Because what are you doing? You're making yourself vulnerable. And this is a very primitive thing. On the Serengeti 250,000 years ago, if a rival tribe person comes at you, he's got, he or she's got a big club, and um, what might they do? Pummel you to death. But maybe, maybe they just need a hug. <laughs> okay, you can put your hands down if you want, or keep them out if you want. And, um, and so there are two benefits to opening yourself up. Literally, this is a physical manifestation of a very powerful emotional experience. When you open yourself up, two things happen. One, people want to come to you because you're sending them a signal. You are open to their entering into your world with a hug or just connection. Also, if you're like this, you're keeping yourself in. You're not allowing yourself to express who you are. You cannot be the best at who you are unless you open yourself up and again, make yourself vulnerable. But then you can take all that energy inside of you, and this is the spiritual side of me that I'm still not entirely comfortable with, um, is by opening yourself up, you can let yourself out. And people can see who you are. And you can fully be who you are. And, and sometimes that's not going to work out and you're going to get hurt. But sooner or later you find your people or your person or your organization. And then it's like, I'm home. Lastly, no regrets. This is one of my most fundamental personal values. My, one of my, my major goals in life is when I'm, when I'm lying on my deathbed, 156 years old, I want to look back at my life and go, you know, things didn't always work out the way I wanted because that's life, but you know what? I left it all out there. I've got no regrets. I wouldn't have changed a thing that was in my control. Every chance I went for, every risk I took, every shot I threw up there. Because that for me is a life worth lived. Wrapping things up, how are we doing on time? We're, oh, we're a little late, we're doing okay. Um, questions, comments? Anybody? No, we're good, okay. Um, two more things. One of the things that, that I, I don't like about coming in and, and giving presentations like this is that I don't get a chance to talk to people and connect with them. And so thankfully they have this thing that you probably heard about, it's called social media. And, um, and so if, if, I, if you have questions, if I can help in any way, if you want to follow me in my writing and read my blog, whatever it might be, you, you can go on to the, you know, the, the three big ones, of course. And um, if you have que personal questions you want to ask me, feel free to reach out. I, I, I so appreciate when people just are willing to ask me a question because it's like, oh, that, that's pretty cool. Um, finally, um, lastly, um, is thank you. First, thank you, Tracy, and thank you, Shannon, for all the great work you've done. I give a lot of talks around the, internationally, and oh, yeah, please, yeah. And, um, and there's nothing like working with pros. 
And they are pros. They were on top of it the whole way, really organized, and so that I appreciate. Finally, I want to thank you folks because you're taking time out of your day and you are listening to me here, sharing ideas, and I've appreciated everything um, you've, uh, I've been able to share with you and um, some of the feedback you've, I can sense and just see in you. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you.